Turn with me to uh, Psalm 61. Verses, as you know, it's got eight verses. We're only going to be looking at the first, um, basically the first two, maybe the first four verses today. And I've been asked by Rudy to give you time to find the references in the Word. So, Rudy, thank you for reminding me of that. I do apologise sometimes I sort of jump ahead and don't give you a chance to, to find a place in the Bible. And guys, up the back there, it's King James Version this morning. Thank you. Uh, Psalm 61. To the chief musician upon Neganar, a psalm of David, hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. Selah. For thou, O God, hast heard my vows. Thou hast given me the heritage of those that fear thy name. Thou wilt prolong the king's life and his years as many generations. He shall abide before God forever. O prepare mercy and truth which may preserve him. So will I sing praise unto thy name forever, that I may daily perform my vows. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning that we are able to come together as brothers and sisters in Christ into fellowship one with another, Lord, and to come in your name and know, Lord, that you are here in our very midst. And we thank you for that, Lord. Words are not enough. But, Lord, we do look to you and we just praise your name. And, Lord, as I bring this message this morning, Father, I, as always, I ask, Father, that I just simply be a voice, Lord, that this is your message. It's all of you and not of me, Father. But I also pray, Lord, as I always do, that these words will hit the mark, that because of what people hear today, by your Holy Spirit, you reveal to each and every one the things that you would have them to understand that pertain to their own life and their walk with you. So we commit this meeting to you this morning, Lord, and we give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee when my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. It's a cry of David's heart. No matter what sin, no matter what difficulty, no matter what danger, what, no, matter what, no matter what persecution he found himself in, he knew what he needed to do. He knew where he needed to go. He knew that he would find shelter and protection there from his enemies. And there he would abide forever, seeking and finding protection in God. When we find ourselves in difficult situations, such as were obviously plaguing David at that time, who knows that none of us are exempt from those difficulties. But when we find ourselves in such difficulties and in need of protection, do we know what to do? and where to turn, and how quickly are we able to do that? How quickly are we able to respond? And as we discussed in my last message, son, go to work in my vineyard, as followers of Jesus Christ, we will suffer persecution in this world. We know that. We understand that. And that can manifest in countless different ways. We may find ourselves in turmoil. We may find ourselves in danger may find ourselves searching for answers, may find ourselves under attack, may find ourselves questioning our faith. We may feel downcast, we may feel broken hearted, we may be hurting, lonely, frightened, unsure, unloved, threatened even. We may be struggling with sin, wrongfully accused, or drowning in debt, or drowning in doubt. So I don't think it's strange that these shouldn't, things should happen to us, because they are going to, and the Lord has told us that it's going to happen. But what is our response when it does? And I can tell you from my own experience, 
our response is not always what it should be. Too often it's a reaction and a panicked one at that. How about you? Turn with me to James chapter 1 verses 19 to 20. James chapter 1 verse 19 to 20. Verse 19. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. We know these words, they're wise words. And we understand that they're spoken in the context of the testing of our faith, which we read about in the preceding 16 verses. And when those difficulties we just spoke about above, when they do come upon us, testing our faith, are we swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath? Or do we do exactly the opposite? And perhaps I'm the Lone Ranger here, but I doubt it. How many of us are prone to rail on in self-pity, often talking to ourselves and focus within ourselves? You know the story. Woe is me. How badly I've been done by. It's not my fault. I wish vengeance was mine, not the Lord's. How much longer must this go on? I can't do this anymore. But isn't this a flesh talking? When we say things like that, aren't we fighting this on our own and talking to ourselves when we should be running to the Lord and listening to him? We know our faith is being tested and at times we almost feel paralysed to take even the tiniest step forward. Who's been there recently? Who's ever been there in that place? Perhaps some are there today. So often we struggle to know where to turn, or perhaps I should say, we struggle to remember where to turn and what to do, let alone turn and do it. And if you think you're in total control of your actions and you know exactly what to do when things go wrong unexpectedly, who of us here can quickly turn off their mobile phone when it goes off during the service? We can't do it, we panic. Who knows that panic paralyses our actions? And it really does cause us to do some very strange things. Now, I want to tell you a story here from the point of view of a young child. Please bear with me. When I was a youngster, only about eight years of age as I recall, my dad took up umpiring in a local cricket competition. And on the second day of his very first match, he took me and my mate Richard to a fairly isolated and picturesque pit cricket ground in the eastern outskirts of Melbourne. And lots of fun there for a couple of young lads. It was a warm day and I was wearing shorts. And during the afternoon we found a heap of empty beer bottles. Not far away there was an old house brick laying on the ground. So we decided to smash those bottles. And great fun, so we thought. So we divided the bottles between us. Richard stood on one side of the brick with his pile of bottles and I stood on my side of the brick over here with my bottles. And we started throwing them and smashing them I was there, Rick was over there, we're throwing at the brick in the middle. We smashed those bottles against the brick. And as he smashed the last bottle, I felt something brush my thigh, my upper left leg. And when I looked down, there was a piece of flesh missing from that leg. That yay long, that yay wide, that yay deep. But to me it looked this long and this wide. <laughs> And I panicked, absolutely. All I could think of was, I have to find that piece of flesh and put it back in my leg. And I ran around trying to find that piece that had come out and put it back, and I couldn't find it, of course. And so in a daze, I ran over to the fence of the cricket ground and called out to Dad, I've cut my leg, I've cut my leg. And he was out in the centre of the ground umpiring, and he called back, just wait a few minutes, and I'll come over at the afternoon tea, and I'll come over and look at it. One of the men was fielding just fairly close to where I was standing at the fence yelling out. And he called out to Dad and said, I'll go and have a look at it, Ump. 
So he sauntered over to me. And when he got to me, he took one look. And he pulled a handkerchief out of his pocket, wrapped it around my leg and just picked me up in his arms. By then, everybody was running towards me. Dad took, him from, took me from him, almost threw me onto the back seat of the car and with Richard in the front seat, we took off to the doctor's house where we lived in Mitcham, probably a 20-minute drive. When we got to the doctor's house, Dad lifted me out of the car and rushed up to the front door. It was closed. No response when he knocked, frantically. And then amazingly, Richard's father came around the corner. He was going for a walk. It seemed to appear from nowhere. And when he saw us, he, he walked up to ask what was going on because he knew we should have been at the cricket and not at the doctor's. And as soon as he saw what had happened and realised that Dad was pretty worried, I was terrified, and Dad was almost on the verge of panicking himself, he calmly said, Richard, you come home with me. Alec, you take Brian and go to the Box Hill Hospital quickly, but I tell you, everything's going to be OK. So he went away. When we got to the hospital, Dad didn't know where the emergency room was. So he stopped the car on the street, grabbed me off the back seat and ran towards the front entrance of the hospital. And as he ran through the front doors with me in his arms, the staff had seen us coming and they were running towards us. One of them grabbed me and I was whisked away to the care of the emergency room. Now, I survived, as you can see. <laughs> and no, it wasn't a life-threatening situation at all. But it was very, very scary for a young lad of eight. Now, when all this happened, there was nothing I could have done as a young lad to help myself. I'd received a bad leg injury through my own stupidity and I needed help. I needed to find my dad because I knew that he would know what to do and he would take care of me. <coughs> and just as an aside to this story, in previous messages you may have heard me speak about the one family in our street that was a Christian family. I don't know whether you have, you may remember, you may not. Only one family that was a Christian family. And when I became a Christian around the age of 40, I realised that I was the only one in my family who was a Christian. And it was a large family. I had seven uncles and three aunties and a couple of dozen cousins. And I often wondered, and I'm sure you've all wondered this thing about yourselves, Who's, who prayed for me? Who was it that was praying for me? And the only people I'd ever think of was that one Christian family who lived in our street. They lived next door to us, actually. There was the mum, the dad, two girls, and a boy called Richard. And yes, it was his father who appeared out of nowhere that day at the doctor's surgery to comfort dad and me and point us to the safety of the hospital. And as I was recalling that incident this week and trying to put it into words, I got quite emotional, as you can see. Because as I remembered it and wrote it down, I suddenly realised that as a young boy in trouble, I turned to my dad and cried out for help. And he had come through. And all that I needed was provided. And I could see God's hand in all of that. And that's been my experience through life. I haven't always known where to go. Or if I did, I didn't always do it. But at such an early age, I saw that pattern. On well, that day as a child, although I panicked, I instinctively knew where to turn for help. So fast forward 30 years, and I was panicked again. This time the stakes were very much higher. Through my own stupidity, and I'm probably saying the same story that you, you guys have experienced as well. Through my own stupidity and loving the world, doing everything my own way, whether legal or not, believing that the end always justified the means, and riding roughshod over anybody and everybody who got in my way, my life had crumbled emotionally, physically and financially. But through an unusual series of events, which can only have been of the Lord, I found myself one day in Festival Hall in Melbourne and I heard a 
the gospel for the first time. And finally, for the first time in my life, I knew where to turn and what to do. Or maybe for the second time in my life. But for the intervening 20 odd years, I ignored it. But like you did, I called out to Jesus and he saved me. And he saved you. The very same way. For we know, as you read in Romans 10 13, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And we all know how Jesus responded to Thomas when asked, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus replied in John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by me. And if Jesus is the only way to come to the Father, then he alone is the one who equips us to stand in victory over the attacks of the God of this world. Because as Christians, as we read in Ephesians 6, 12, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So when we find ourselves suddenly and viciously under attack, as we inevitably will, some of us are experiencing that even today, we must know where to turn and what to do. So let's back up a couple of verses in, um, in Ephesians, Ephesians 6, Chapters 10 through 13. And I was just quoting from them, Rudy, so we will actually go back and read them now, mate. Ephesians 6, 10 through 13. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armour of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armour of God, that you may be able to stand, to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. And so, it must never be, what will I do, what will I do? Like, the old story, Chicken Little running around in the barnyard yelling out, the sky is falling in, the sky is falling in. Or like me, running around looking for the piece of flesh that was missing out of my leg. No, it must be, I know exactly what to do. I'll turn to the Lord, just as David did. And it must be as a first response, not as a last resort. Hear my cry, O God. Attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Let's look a little more closely at what David's saying here and how, how we can understand his utter dependence upon God, his God. And to do that, let me quote to you from the Believer's Bible commentary on these verses. And so I quote, Psalm 61, the rock that is higher than I. David had a wonderful relationship with the Lord. To him, God was a living, bright reality, more present to faith's vision keen than any earthly object seen, more dear, more intimately nigh than e'en the closest earthly tie, author unknown. Especially in times of danger, when the situation seemed utterly hopeless, he had learned to cast his burdens on the Lord and leave it there. Or his burden upon the Lord and leave it there. Here he is in another of those cliff-hanging predicaments. Who knows he faced many of those in his life. Who knows we face many of those in our lives. That was an aside. The pressure of the circumstances rings from David's heart a prayer that has seldom been surpassed for sheer poignancy and articulateness. It has become the timeless language of thousands of God's people as they have passed through persecution, heartache and suffering because it says what they feel but could never express so well. Verse 1, into the throne room of the universe comes the familiar voice of David. Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. 
and God's heart is delighted. The childlike faith of his servant assures instant audience with the sovereign. From the end of the earth will I cry to you, and my heart is overwhelmed. The psalmist is not literally at the end of the world, but he is literally in a place of extremity where safety and deliverance seem so remote, where life ends and death begins. Physically and emotionally, he's spent, but he knows that the throne of grace is only a breath away, so he draws near to receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. A distance, someone has said, is meaningless and has no extremity of life effective in blocking prayer. Sorry, I'll say that again. Distance, someone has said, is meaningless and no extremity of life effective in blocking prayer. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. A true spiritual instinct teaches David that he needs a rock for protection, that the rock must be higher than himself and that he needs divine guidance to reach it. The Lord, of course, is the rock. 2 Samuel 22, 33, 32, sorry. 2 Samuel 22, 33 says, For who is God save the Lord? And who is a rock save our God? This metaphor is never used of any mere man in the Bible. The rock must be someone greater than man. Otherwise, man can never find shelter in it. And this points to the deity of Christ. And incidentally, the rock must be cleft to provide a hiding place from the enemy. And finally, David acknowledges that he does not have the wisdom or strength to direct his own steps. And so he asks the Lord to lead him to himself, the rock of ages. End quote. The God of this world is coming after each and every one of us with lies, deceptions, accusations, divisions and trials of every imaginable kind. And we are in a battle. And praise the Lord, the battle is not ours, it's the Lord's. And we must understand that every trial, every temptation, every difficulty, every attack, every dark place is a testing of our faith. We read earlier from James 1, verses 19 and 20, to be swift to hear, slow to speak and slow to wrath. And we talked about that in the context of testing your faith. Now let's read the first six or the preceding 16 verses there. Pardon me. So James chapter 1, verses 2, actually 2 to 8. So James 1, 2 to 8. James 1, 2 to 8. I'll get it right. So verse 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have a perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Wouldn't it be good if we could stop there? But of course we can't. We're in this world and we know our fallen state, we know we are forgiven, but we are not perfect. So we can't stop there, so we go on. Verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. And there's so very much here. I'm not going to delve into all of it this morning. That's for another time, perhaps. But what I want to say is simply this. When trials and problems do come, and they will, when we find ourselves in danger and in need of protection, instead of becoming desperate and frantic, and prepared to use any means whatsoever to shorten the trial, we ought to be thankful that we know where to turn and what to do, as David did. Hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee, and my heart is overwhelmed. Lead me to the rock that is higher than I. But now, 
some tough questions for us. When we do call upon the Lord, as David did, let me ask you this. Is it really a cry that we would like the Lord to hear? Is it, Lord, I'm shattered, I'm devastated, I give up, it's got to be your way? Or is it, Lord, help me to overcome this problem in my way? Is it really a prayer? Is it, Lord, your will be done? Or is it, Lord, this is what I need you to do for me? Are our hearts really overwhelmed? Or are we just uncomfortable and annoyed and frustrated because we're not getting our own way? Do we really want to be led to the rock? Or are we just looking for a get-out-of-jail-free card? The rock that we plead to be led to is an everlasting rock, the rock of ages. As we read in Isaiah 26.4, you can go there if you like, but it's one verse, Isaiah 26.4. So trust in the Lord. Sorry, this is from the Amplified. So trust in the Lord, commit yourself to him, lean on him, hope confidently in him forever. For the Lord God is an everlasting rock, the rock of ages. When we go to the rock, we find protection and shelter. Are we ever at a loss to know where to turn and what to do? I don't believe as Christians we're ever unaware of what we need to do. I think it's deeper than that. I think at times we don't fully understand or accept or else we've forgotten that as Christians our sin has been dealt with past, present and future. You know, last week we sang at length during the service about the blood that washes us as white as snow, about the blood that cleanses us from all our sin. But there is power in the blood and the blood will never lose its power. But I fear that when some of us slip and fall and even though we confess our sins and seek his forgiveness, there are times when we don't believe we can be forgiven for what we've done and we continue to hold on to our guilt for hours, days, weeks, months, even years. And it paralyses us from turning to him and trusting in him as we should because we believe we're being judged for what we have done. Very, very early in my Christian walk, I used to think that God was watching over me every minute of the day looking for a gotcha moment when he could punish me for what I'd just done. But that's simply not true. There are, of course, consequences for our sin in this world. We may bring upon ourselves a cross to bear. And the Lord does allow trials and testing in our lives as he brings us to maturity in him. But it's in the context of him being the author and finisher of our faith, Hebrews 12.2, that he allows or brings these things to pass in our lives. And we know that he's begun a good work in us and he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. We read that in Philippians 1.6. The trials are not for the purpose of punishing us. They are for the purpose of convicting us that we must be changed and changed from within. That We must turn to him and only he can change us to be conformed into the image of his son. Romans 8.29 says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Ah, the judgment of God, that comes later. Hebrews 9.27 As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And those of us who are Christians... That judgment will be the beamer seat. For everybody else, it's going to be the great white throne judgment. You know, Jesus addressed this matter of judgment and punishment pretty clearly in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5. So turn with me there, Luke 13, 1 through 5. Many people think that because of the things they've done in their lives, the Lord's always going to be punishing them. 
But Jesus said, when some they spoke to him, let's, let's start at Luke chapter 13, verse 1. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Or those eighteen upon whom the tower in Siloam fell and slew them, think ye that they were sinners above all men that dwelt in Jerusalem? I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. The tower didn't fall on them because of of being punished by God. Things happen, things go wrong. We're all on a different path through this life and different things happen to each and every person. It's not punishment. A judgment comes later. But if we refuse to repent, we're going to perish because that means we don't go to the Lord and seek his forgiveness. And we're talking about those in the world. Who knows where we all were before we came to Christ. We weren't going to repent for anything we did and we were going to perish except that he saved us by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. So none of us are perfect. We all fall so very, very short of his glory. We all make mistakes. We all get it wrong. We all sin. But as I said, when we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, we are declared not guilty forever. And when we do slip and fall, as, as Gilly reminded us so clearly last week, we have an advocate, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. We read in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, don't fall prey to the lies of the God of this world when he tells you that you are guilty and beyond redemption and you're being punished. You are not. John 3, 16 to 17. I don't even need to read this one out to you, but I will. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And if you're still in doubt about where you stand, about being punished and about judgment and about sin, listen to what David says in Psalm 103, verses 8 through 12. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Psalm 103, verses 8 through 12. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. He will not always chide, neither will he keep his anger for ever. He has not dealt with us after our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy, mercy toward them that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. And so, as I bring this to a close, in understanding all of that about sin, punishment and judgment, let's go back to Psalm 61. The first four verses. To the chief musician upon Neganar, a psalm of David, hear my cry, O God, attend unto my prayer. From the end of the earth will I cry unto thee. When my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For thou hast been a shelter for me and a strong tower from the enemy. I will abide in thy tabernacle forever. I will trust in the covert of thy wings. Selah. Rock of ages is our Lord. And in the cover of his wings we find protection and shelter. We also find a place of grace and of mercy, a place of forgiveness, a place of healing, a place of blessing, and above all, a 
place of God's agape love. Let's pray. We do thank you, Lord, for your word, your living word, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that uh, through your word, you bring to us by your Holy Spirit understanding and truth, and that you do indeed guide us and lead us, Father. Lord, we can never fathom the depths of your word. Father, no matter how often we read and seek your face, there is always more that we need to know and understand and learn. And we, we, we realise that, Father. But Lord, as we have read from your word this day, Lord, I pray that it will find its mark in our heart, in deep understanding, Lord, written upon the tablets of our heart, that we do know and understand our relationship with you, that we do know and understand to flee to you, to seek your protection and abide in the shadow of your wings. Father, you are our all in all. May we be swift to turn to you and run to you, Father. May all the glory be yours, in Jesus' name.